Hello and welcome back. In this video, we will wrap up our very short discussion of Markov chains for use in Markov chain Monte Carlo estimates later. So let's jump straight in. There are two more things we still need to understand about Markov chain. And one is how the distribution of XT changes as T changes. And the second aspect is we need to understand what a stationary distribution is. So let's start with the first one. We assume that at time t we have some distribution, which we may denote by pi, assuming the state space is continuous. Pi would be the vector of probabilities for each state. So pi x is the probability of x t being equal to x for all x in S. So that is denoted by saying pi is the distribution of x t. And if we assume we know that pi, so th these probabilities equal the values from a given pi, then we can ask the question, what happens after one time step? So what happens at time t plus one? So what I want to do is I add a little t here to say that that's at time t. And then I can ask the question, what is pi t plus one? So the distribution of x t plus one, one time step later. And the answer to this is not difficult to work out. Namely, we have the component x of pi t plus 1. That is, by definition, the probability that x t plus 1 equals little x. And that we can split into the individual events by what did x at time t do. So we can write some y in s, that is all possible states, probability of x t plus 1 equals x and x t equals y. And these events are disjoint. They are disjoint because I'm looking at what does x t do and I'm considering all possible values. So the union of these events is that event. And since the events are disjoint, the sum of the individual probabilities equals the probability of the combined event. So we have this. And then we are going to use Bayes' rule. Let me just remind you that is in probability. The probability of A given B is the probability of A and B divided by the probability of B. So that is technically the definition of a conditional probability. And Bayes' rule is if I multiply it through with B of B, so that is probability of A and B equals probability A condition B times probability of B. And we are using it in the second form. This comma here means and, so we can apply the rule. So that is sum over all possible states y. Probability of x t plus 1 equals x conditioned on x t equals y times probability of x t equals y. So that's Bayes' rule, like I just explained it. And now we see that both of these terms we know. That here, that is an element of the transition matrix, namely that the probability of going from y to x in one step. So that is p y x. I need to be a bit careful with the order. I'm going from y to x, so I write p y x. And this expression here that we know from the previous page, that is that one. So we can just write pi t y for that. And that's our answer. That tells us how do we get pi t plus 1 from pi t. And there is a small extra step one can do, namely if you look at this expression and if you remember a bit from linear algebra, that looks very nearly like a matrix vector multiplication. The only problem is x and y here are in the wrong order. And what you can do is you can swap them if instead of p you look at p transpose. You can write that as p transpose pi and then element x of the resulting vector. And that is a useful thing. So that holds for all x in S. And if you look at that equation, so it's p transpose pi t element x. That tells us really how do we get from pi t to pi t plus 1 is we multiply a p, the transition matrix transposed from the left. And let me just write this in red. There's an alternative way. If you take tran the transpose of the whole equation, then you can do pi t plus 1 transpose equals 
pi t transpose times p. So that's another way to write this. That would mean we write pi as a row vector like that. And then we would have here the row vector from a time earlier and here we would just have p. Whereas down here we keep pi in the usual form, pi t plus 1. But the price is we need to transpose the transition matrix. So we have p transpose times pi t. In either way, what we get is doing one time step just means applying p once. And we can iterate this. So what we get is, for example, if we start with the initial distribution, then we get pi t is p transpose to the power of t times pi zero. So that here is the initial distribution, the thing we called only pi earlier. And to get from the initial distribution to the distribution at times t, we just need to multiply p transpose from the left t times. So I can write that as the t's power. Okay, that solves the first question. Namely, that tells us how does the distribution of xt changes as t increases. The answer is we need to multiply p, the transition matrix, from the left every time we do a time step. Now, the other thing I wanted to discuss is very closely related, namely that is the stationary distribution. Pi is a stationary distribution. If when pi is the distribution at time t, if we assume that's true, that then we can also conclude that at time t plus 1, that is also true. I wrote that a bit informally here, so again here by this I mean we assume that at time t the distribution is pi in the sense we just discussed it. And then if we can conclude that then the same holds at time t plus 1, then pi is called the stationary distribution. And the technical definition uses what we just did, namely that means doing a time step does not change the distribution. So pi is a distribution where if we start there, we stay there. So that means in the logic we just did. So times t and times t plus 1 is the same. We don't change. That means we can multiply p transpose from the left and nothing changes. So we get p transpose pi equals pi. Or equivalently, if we had, I take the transpose of the whole, whole equation, I get pi transpose p equals pi transpose. So that is the definition. It's the second line. That's what you will find in books. And that is justified by what we just did, namely if p transpose pi equals pi, that means if the Markov chain ever reaches distribution pi, then it will stay there forever because every time we do a step, we multiply from the left with p transpose and that equation says nothing happens. And if you have ever done a module on Markov chains, you probably learned that there is a deep theory behind this and there are criteria you can learn about when is a distribution a stationary distribution and when does the Markov chain have stationary distributions and you can go very far in this direction but for our purpose here we really just need the definition. So a distribution is stationary if p transpose pi equals pi. And there is one technical trick how to find stationary distributions on a computer. Namely, let me use the form p transpose pi equals pi. And what I want to do is I want to write here 1 times pi. That seems to make no difference. I just added the number 1. But if you look at that equation, matrix p transpose times vector pi equals number 1 times pi, then possibly you recognize this from linear algebra. That equation means that pi is an eigenvector of p transpose with eigenvalue 1. So that is equivalent to pi is an eigenvector of p transpose with eigenvalue 1. And that is a useful fact both for theory and for practical purposes. For practical purposes, we can use that R, for example, or many computer systems have built-in functions for finding eigenvectors and eigenvalues. So what you can do is you can just plug the matrix P transpose into one of these functions, then get a list of eigenvectors and eigenvalues and pick out the eigenvector which goes with the eigenvalue 1. And if there is one, you know that is a stationary distribution. Good. Let's try that out with our previous example. So 
that's very called what was the matrix. The matrix was one half, one half, zero, zero, one half, one half, one zero, zero. So we need to find the eigenvalues of this and the function in R to do that is called eigen. The help is here. Spectral decomposition of a matrix computes eigenvalues and eigenvectors of numeric or complex weight matrices. And I leave this to you to read. We can just try it out. Eigen P gives two components, namely the eigenvalues and the eigenvectors. And you notice the eigenvalues are complex numbers. So that is one, one half i and minus one half i. And one, this one, one plus zero i, that is the one we are looking out for. And then we need to just find out are the eigenvectors stored in columns or rows of this matrix. I believe it's columns. Let's check. Vectors. Either in P times P matrix whose columns contain the eigenvectors of x or null if we didn't request eigenvectors. So what we need is we need the columns. I store that in a variable. Still we need the first one. So the eigenvector we can use. Before we can use this we need to fix the mistake. Have you spotted the mistake? I need the eigenvalues of t transpose. So I use little t to transpose this. So let's try that again. E is now really the eigenvalues of p transpose. The eigenvalues of p transpose are the same as the eigenvalues for p, but the vectors are changed. And you see e vectors comma one, that is the first column, gives us minus two third minus two third minus third. So that is the vector. And eigenvectors are only defined up to multiplicative constants, so we can ignore the minus. It could just as well be two third, two third, one third. And this one here is chosen, I believe, that the length is one. We can do by stationary is two third, two third, one third. That is the same. Only I left out the empty imaginary parts and wrote it as real numbers and I multiplied with minus one, which I can do for eigenvectors. And now how do we get the probabilities? As I just said, eigenvectors are only defined up to multiplicative constants. So we want these values to sum to one. So what we need to do is this. We divide by the sum. So afterwards you see the sum is in fact one, 0.4 plus 0.4 plus 0.2 equals one. It's still an eigenvector and that is our stationary distribution. Let's just verify that. So I just re redefine pi star to be that new value. So first transpose p matrix multiplication with pi stat gives the same as we just had, 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.2. So that checks out. And also if we start the Markov chain with this, I just modifying the code on the left. So if I write 0 0.4, 0 0.4, 0 0.2, then the Markov chain should in every step have these probabilities. So every state has a probability 0.4 for being equal to one, 0.4 being equal to two, and 0.2 for being equal to three. And we can just test this with a histogram like that. Namely, if we do more steps, then the ratios should converge to probabilities. If I do 10,000 steps, we should be pretty close. So if that is right, then we should, let me do a proper histogram with probabilities we should get back these probabilities in the histogram. And you see that work perfectly. We have 0 0.4, 0 0.4 for states one and two, and 0 0.2 for state three. Now, just as a last experiment, I want to try what happened with this histogram for the original initial distribution. So let's comment this out and go back to one third, one third, one third. And so you see the answer is very nearly the same. And I believe the difference may be in the range of noise. Yes, so if I run it a few times, it fluctuates a bit. And so something odd is going on here. I just argued if I start like this, then it's logical by the things I explained. We stay at these probabilities. And because every step has these probabilities, then just 0.4 is the fraction of states where we are in state one and so on. And what's going on here is there are theoretical results, which we're not going to cover here, but which you can learn about in Markov chain courses, which say that often 
you converge to the stationary distribution. So here I start differently, I start with one third, one third, one third, but the Markov chain mixes things around and after a number of ste steps I should get closer and closer and closer to what we found is a stationary distribution. And that's not always true, so there are conditions attached with this, but if you have learned about Markov chains, they are called the Markov chain must be irreducible and aperiodic. But ours has these properties, so one can, if one knows the theory, show we should converge to the stationary distribution. And we see in the histogram that's what has happened here. So there is a small deviation from these probabilities because we start out differently, but then there is noise anyway. And after 10,000 steps, we are close enough that the histogram comes out quite similar to the first one. Good. And that's what I wanted to show you here. So, this concludes our discussion of Markov chains. Thanks for watching.